In a previous video, I demonstrated the synthesis of 2-naphthal starting from naphthalene. And in this video, I'll demonstrate the bromination of that product to form 6-bromo-2-naphthal, which is required for the synthesis of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory compound naproxen that also goes by the brand name of Aleve. For this preparation, I'll be following the 1940s paper from Organic Syntheses. However, I'll be running the reaction at a 0.28 scale as compared to what was done in this paper. Getting started, to a 500ml round bottom flask, I added 40 grams of 2-naphthal, followed by 110 milliliters of glacial acetic acid. And while the 2-naphthal was dissolving, I moved on to preparing a solution of 89 grams of bromine and 28 milliliters of glacial acetic acid. Also keep in mind that any handling of bromine must be done in a very well ventilated space. Attached to the apparatus is a gas washing bottle loaded with saturated sodium bicarbonate solution to absorb the hydrogen bromide gas which is evolved during the bromination. There's also an inline trap to prevent the suck back of the washing solution into the reaction flask. Once everything was set up, I began the dropwise addition of the bromine solution into the flask. I added the bromine over the course of 30 minutes and the reaction was mildly exothermic. The exotherm was most noticeable where the bromine was running down the wall of the flask. However, the exotherm was not significant enough to evolve excessive amounts of hydrogen bromide as indicated by the bubbler trap, so I did not need to implement any cooling measures during the addition. There is also the formation of these red crystalline deposits around the bromine solution. Once the bromine addition had been completed, I opened up the flask, which released quite a bit of hydrogen bromide vapor, and I then quickly added 28 milliliters of water before sealing the flask back up. I then turned on the heating in my mantle and brought the mixture to reflux. And once the mixture started boiling, I turned off the heat and allowed the mixture to cool down for 5 minutes. This brief heating period serves to bring the bromination reaction to completion before moving on to the next step. And also be sure to look out for suckback during this cooling period. Now that the bromination step is complete, we get to move on to the reduction step, where by adding metallic tin, we're going to reduce the 1,6-dibromo-2-naphthal into 6-bromo-2-naphthal. The addition of the tin is broken up into three separate portions, since the reduction is a bit exothermic and also releases hydrogen gas. On opening up the flask, you can see that some hydrogen bromide gas is released, so I quickly added the 7-gram portion of mossy tin, and then resealed the flask. The mixture is then heated to reflux until this tin portion is fully dissolved. After boiling the solution for approximately 10 minutes, the majority of the initial tin that was added had fully dissolved, and so I was ready to add the second 7 gram portion of tin. This time you can see that the hydrogen bromide release was less substantial, as the tin dissolves by reacting with the hydrogen bromide that was released from the previous bromination step. The second tin portion took around 15 minutes to dissolve, just slightly longer than the first one. I then got ready to add the third and final portion of tin. This time, a larger 27.8 gram portion of tin is added. In this clip, you'll see why the tin addition was broken up into three portions. Since when I tried to pour in this larger tin portion, it got stuck in the funnel this time. In this scenario, what I should have done was just remove the funnel and then restopper the flask. However, you can see me struggling to push down the tin, and I did eventually succeed, but you can see the flask really starting to boil. Though in the end, I did manage to get away with it, however, it's a good lesson on why you shouldn't overfill your flasks, and also a good learning experience in case something like this happens again. But on top of all that, there was also a small piece of tin that got stuck in the joint which temporarily compromised the seal. With the tin additions completed, now the mixture simply needs to be refluxed for 3 hours to allow the reduction to proceed. After the 3 hour reflux has elapsed, the mixture then needs to be cooled down to 50 degrees celsius to allow the tin salts to precipitate out before being filtered off. Once the temperature of the mixture hit 50 degrees celsius, I filtered it using a vacuum aspirator and then washed the precipitate with 30 milliliters of cold glacial acetic acid. The product was then crashed out from the filtrate by pouring it into 850 milliliters of ice cold water. The precipitate was then filtered off using a large glass fritted funnel. I then transferred the filtered pasty material back into a beaker and then washed it with 300 milliliters of ice cold water before filtering it again. 
I then moved the material into a glass tray and let it air dry for two days. After which it still wasn't fully dry, so I transferred it into a flask and then dried it under vacuum with a hot water bath. But even after 7 hours of drying under vacuum, the material still wasn't fully dry, so I decided to just move on to the vacuum distillation. Now the procedure claims that the crude material recovered directly from the reaction is pure enough for most purposes, but I wanted to show the entire procedure, so I decided to showcase the distillation as well. The vacuum distillation is quite intensive, since the 6-bromo-2 naphthol boils at a very high temperature, even under vacuum. The Orgson paper ran its distillation at 20 millimeters of mercury and collected everything in the range of 200 to 205 degrees Celsius. However, my vacuum pump only went down to 50 millimeters of mercury and I ended up collecting over the range of 220 to 250 degrees Celsius. Although this is not such a big concern, as the main point of this distillation is to remove the non-volatile tin salts. But there is another issue with this distillation, being that the product melts between 120 and 130 degrees Celsius, so the whole time I had to assist the distillation with a heat gun to ensure that the condenser didn't get clogged. If I were to run this distillation again, I'd opt for a much simpler setup and forgo the cowbell, as I didn't end up needing to use it. I ended up collecting 53.9 grams of distillate, which corresponds to an 87% yield. According to the Orgson paper, the yield after distillation can range from 77-96%, to 96%, so I got a fair value. However, we're not done with the purification just yet. The next step is to recrystallize the distillate from a mixture of acetic acid and water. And so to start I added 170 milliliters of glacial acetic acid and then heated until all of the material was fully dissolved. I then added 340 milliliters of water, which I recommend doing in a few portions, waiting for the mixture to heat back up to boiling between each addition. This ensures that you don't get a bunch of material crashing out all at once, which might stop the stir bar. Once all the water had been added and the solution was reheated to boiling, I took it off the heat and allowed it to slowly cool down to room temperature. As the mixture cooled, a layer of oil separated out at the bottom before solidifying, followed by the crystallization of our product from the solution. I then cooled down the beaker in the fridge to ensure maximal precipitation, and then carefully broke up the crystalline material, ensuring not to disturb the oil layer too much. I then filtered the crystalline slurry before drying thoroughly on the pump, and then moving the material onto a glass dish and allowing it to dry to a constant weight in air. After drying, it looked like the stuff that had oiled out took on a pink coloration, while the material that crystallized was still white, and I didn't trust the heterogeneity, so I decided to do some melting point tests of both this oiled and crystallized material to see if there's any difference. I found the melting point of the crystallized product to range from 126 to 127 degrees, which was in a fair agreement with the reported Orxin melting point of 127 to 129 degrees Celsius. However, the material that oiled out had a melting point ranging from 122 to 125 degrees Celsius, indicating that it had some impurity or solvent inclusion that the crystallized material didn't. And this made me want to perform a second recrystallization of just the oiled material. I also ran a TLC to check if there was any impurities in what oiled out. It showed that there was a small amount of some non-polar impurity present in the oiled fraction that wasn't in the crystallized fraction, so that further motivated me to do the additional recrystallization. I first had to manually parse through my product to separate what had oiled out from what crystallized, and this was done by just feeling for any hard lumps, and that was assumed to be oiled material, while the crystallized material was quite soft, and I had left it behind. I recovered 32.1 grams of crystalline product and another 15.3 grams of that oiled material. Moving the oiled fraction forwards, I recrystallized it from 60 mL of glacial acetic acid and 100 mL of distilled water. And like last time, there was the appearance of a layer that oiled out instead of recrystallizing. I only broke up the crystallized material before filtering, allowing me to separate it from what oiled out. From this second recrystallization, I got another 7.6 grams of crystals, and also 5.7 grams of more oiled material. I also ran some TLCs. The leftmost plate shows 2 naphthol against the first crop of crystallized material, and you can see that there's not much difference between the RF of 2 naphthol and the 6-bromo-2 naphthol, and I couldn't find an eluent mixture that successfully separates them. The middle plate is with the first and second crops of crystallized material, and the rightmost plate is with the first crop of crystallized material and the second crop of oiled material. 
and you can see that there's still that high RF spot from both the crystallized and oiled material from the second recrystallization, though it is a very faint spot at that. Using vanillin stain, the starting 2 naphthol takes on a color much more rapidly and develops a much stronger color than the 6 bromo 2 naphthol product. However, I wasn't super satisfied with this stain as it just gave spots with two different shades of the same color. So I decided to do one last test to figure out if I could differentiate between 2 naphthol and 6 bromo 2 naphthol, and for that, I took a mixed melting point. I combined equal masses of 2 naphthol and the 6 bromo 2 naphthol, and then finely ground them together. If the two compounds are different, it typically results in a melting point depression, whereas if the two compounds were the same, then the melting point should be unchanged. When I took the melting point, I got a result of 97 degrees Celsius, far below both the melting points of 2 naphthol and 6 bromo 2 naphthol, indicating that I have two different compounds. And on taking all the data together, I'm confident in saying that I have made 6 bromo 2 naphthol. And in the future, I'll also be using this product in my naproxen synthesis, so you'll also get to see all the characterization data from the derivatives I make from this. In other news, the channel just hit 5,000 subscribers, which I'm immensely thankful for. It's nice to see that the channel is still growing a little despite my infrequent posting. And of course, I'd like to give a big thanks to all my subscribers and Patreons for sticking around and supporting the channel. Thanks for watching.